www.sonyyoutube.com. This is Ben Ash at VA Guitar Tuition. Hope you all had a great summer this year. And seeing it's been a while since I've released the video, I wanted to make sure I put something off that was a bit more challenging and was definitely worth the wait. So the song I've chosen for this particular lesson is going to be none other than Alison Hill from the 980s 1989 Roadrunner debut release, Alison Hill. Now the reason I picked this particular song is that of recent years there's been quite a renaissance within the thrash metal movement. Where if you're looking at the obvious notification of the big four getting back together and doing the Sonosphere Festival roundup, or if you look at let's say some of Earache's records recent signings such as Short Sharp Shock, um, you've also got Municipal Waste, uh, you've got Evile, and um, you've got Gamma Bomb, they really have picked up and kind of you know, taking the baton of kind of getting Thrash back on the map uh, for the metal scene again, and they're doing really, really good at it. So um, to kind of capture that energy and really pass it on to a number of my students or any of you watching out there, I thought looking at this particular song was an absolute gem because for most of you Thrash purists, it might seem a little bit obvious. Like, you know, why don't you go for the single? Why don't you go for uh, anything on Never Neverland or anything off the um, self-titled new album? Well, the reason being is that Alison Hill. You know, whatever style you pick it, it is a classic. And it has an absolute goldmine of great, great guitar performances on there. Whether you're looking at fast uh, triplet action for your rhythm guitar, or you're looking at some really just tasty phrasing within your guitar solo lines, it's a really, really great song to look at. So that's the reason I picked it. And here's the way it's going to go for this particular lesson. Now, rather than ramming all this information into one very, very long epic video, what I decided to do is actually divide it into three separate lessons. The first lesson we're going to have a look at is going to be breaking down the intro of the song, which has about five different movements in it. And then the second lesson we'll be looking at the verse and chorus of the song, leaving the third and final video to look at the middle eight, the solo, and the outros. And that will be appropriate study technique as we go through each particular section. So let's get cracking, tune up, rock out, and we'll see you soon. intro section of the song. What I've done is I've broken it down to five different movements just so that it makes it a little bit more logical for an arrangement study. The first particular movement we're going to have a look at are the chord slashes. After the four bar intro on the bass, the first chord that is actually in play on the guitar is an A minor 7 with a flat 5. <laughs> It has a very spooky, eerie feel to it because of all those dissonant intervals that create the scale. Now, about the context of the actual root note of A, it sounds a little more like C 
minor in this fifth position. But as soon as you implied note of A, that's when you get your dissonant quality to it. To make the chord a little bit fuller, you can actually add the fifth in the chord. Stacking the actual diagonal triad on top. And it puts a real bit of conflict in there as well because you've got the triad tone and the perfect fifth, which are only a semitone apart, even though they're split by an octave. Gives it a bit of clarity as well, but also gives it a really nice spooky, eerie feel to it. And that's played for a duration of four bars. Um, play one bar and extending onto the next. And then going into the next part, we're going to be using some conventional power chords, starting off with the A5 power chord, going to the E flat 5 power chord. <laughs> You can actually play these in a slightly more traditional position, such as the 2nd fret for your A5, and then juxtapositioning to your D-based E-flat 5 on the D-string, starting rooting on the 1st finger on the 1st fret of the D. Gives it a real, real nasally bite to it. And what you can do for those chords is intermix them, going from, let's say, the more Sabbathy approach using the bass strings, or having the slightly more trebly approach using the low register of the neck. And going into our second movement, we're going to be having a look at an eighth note triplet riff, which is going to be played across the low E and A strings using the A minor diatonic scale. And it's going to be an ascending and descending motif, climbing up through the bass string, going 5th, 7th, 8th fret, and then resolving on the 7th fret of the A string, which is the 5th of the scale, and then coming back down. So a full bar of that particular passage sound like this. Now a little pointer about this particular motion is the BPM I'm saying is around about 138. Uh, the traditional time signature is in 4-4, but what you can do is apply it into a compound signature which will turn it into 12-8, which should sound a little bit like this. So it keeps that consistent 8th note triplet, 1 and a 2 and a 3 and a 4, and I'm going through the whole motion. And this really, really helps to actually tighten up that riff. Now you probably noticed when I went into that second bar that the actual resolve has now moved from the 7th fret on the A string, now going to the 6th fret on the A string. which is going to be your tritone. Once again, emphasising that real evil tone within the actual piece. That being a two bar measure, being one round, and then you basically just do another round for that particular section. Keeping a nice hefty palm mute across your bass strings to give it plenty of chug. Um, Jeff would quite often play this with downstrokes um, to give it lots and lots of visceral attack. But I tend to actually play it with alternate picking because it just tends to be a little bit more economical and I don't tend to actually lose that much thwack out from when hitting the string. And it keeps a nice flowing momentum on there as well, nothing too jagged. Then it moves into um, a flat third harmony, um, which is going to jump up an octave. Going to 10th fret on the D string, keeping the same kind of motif that we did in the lower register. While there'll be a secondary guitar still playing the root note motion. So you'll basically get a collection of flat third movement through this point, and it sounds really, really cool. The 
first round is pretty much standard as what we did before in the lower register, but the tail end is a little bit different for the second time. <laughs> What it does is it holds on to that tritone and then it resolves to an octave from that particular tritone with the pinky finger extending all the way to the 14th fret. The same motif that you were doing previously before in the lower register. Going into the octave which would be on the 7th fret. This time with no palm mute, keeping it nice and open. And it will then key change, going from one bar to the next. So the first bar will be in A minor. And then it will go for a two bar measure into G. What we did there was add a little pinch, going across on the tritone. The movement which is on the sixth fret of the G string. When it goes round for a second time that particular movement what we do is rather than resolving with the pinch we actually go from that particular note and extend into a C sharp 5 power chord. Lead us into our fourth movement which is going to be our double time thrash riff. Um, which will then juxtaposition from the 8th note triplet going to straight 16th note motion. Uh, you can keep the BPM relatively straight on this. Um, even though in double time, if we're at 138, it will feel more to equivalent of, let's say, um, 280 to 270. Um, I'd like to play off the back beat a little bit on this, so I tend to actually just keep it ticking around 138 and just play off the subdivision. Keeps it nice and tight so I don't actually push it too far and keeps a nice steady groove. So you get like this. Little motif going through. The shape of C minor diatonic. on the A string, starting from the 3rd fret, picking through a group of 16s, and then resolving back to your C on your 3rd fret. And we do that particular line uh, three times. And then we have a 16th note chug on the open A string. Resolving with a C5 power chord. Do the same thing again, but the tail end rather being on the C5, we then move down to a G sharp 5. Both motions should sound like this. Also implies is going back to the flat third harmony, stepping through the C minor scale. Starting here on the flat third, keeping the same motion that you did here, basically just doing that from the flat third but keeping the same scale intervals. Flat third, fourth, and fifth. And still keeping the tail ends of the C5 and the G sharp 5. After that particular section, you then get a breakdown of um, descending octaves. to our fifth movement is going to be a little baroque progression. Well, I tend to 
do is change the actual positions a little bit. I start off with rather than say bar position D minor, we create that little diagonal triad going across from the fifth fret, sixth fret, and the seventh fret, starting from the top E to the B to the G with an open D, keeping the tonic ringing through there. And then extending the pinky finger across to the eighth fret. Bring that as a pull off to actually put the descending fashion in the arpeggio. And what I tend to do with the picking is rather than doing everything with downstrokes, as I'm actually opposing to do my next movement, let's say I'm starting from the D, then do the pull off from the eighth fret with an upstroke and follow the rest of the motion with upstrokes because then it keeps a nice momentum going down through each of these chords and this is exactly what I do with every single motion. The next chord we go to um, is the A sharp, but what we do is that the suspended six and then it has this little legato line adding on top we don't add the bass note here, but we keep the bar for the rest of the chord. We arpeggiate that from the D string. And then extending the third finger to the fifth fret, we do this little descending fashion, little legato line there, bass between the fifth and third fret, and resolving there on the note C on the G string. movement going into my C with the sus4, take the barring motion, slide that into the fifth fret, extend my pinky to get my bass note on my low E string, it's more reminiscent of a G inversion of the tip of the chord, and it picks through a little bit like this. First of all you tend to hear more the C major but the actual suspended fourth comes in from when I add my second finger across here on the 6th fret of the B and then pull off back down to the 5th fret on the same string. Once again, it's keeping that picking motion of down, 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 down. The previous up, version up, you up. saw was doing an A7 there, which is very popular to see Jeff doing this live. But the one I tend to pick, which is more reminiscent of what has been used in the studio recording, is the E bass bar of the A7 on the 5th fret adding the pinky to the 8th fret of the B, giving an octave onto the flat 7 of the chord. And once again, just arpeggiating in the 8th note flat shape. But for the most part, when you tend to see this section played live, it's done very much in free time with just a single guitar. But to give some regimentation to it, um, I'll probably recommend that say a BPM of 69 beats per minute and it just keeps you in place basically. And uh, that progression goes round for one round and as it goes into its second, rather than actually going to the C chord at that point, it then drops down to an A5 power chord with a steady building chug with a little bit more gain in the time. And you can also imply some artificial harmonics across the um, open A string. And to get those different notes, all you do is basically just move across from your bridge position to your neck position to get all those different harmonics going across the A string. Okay, that brings us to the end of part one. We'll see you back here for part two, where we'll be looking at the verse and chorus of the song. If there's any questions or queries about this video, please just drop a link in the D bar, or alternatively visit my YouTube channel. And we'll see you soon. Keep rocking and stay inspired.